like unto who shall dwell in thy holy hill. He that walk uprightly and work righteously and speak the truth in his heart. He that backs not in the hill. Shall we pray? Eternal and everlasting Father, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We come this morning, Father, just to say thank you, Father. We come, Father, to say thank you, Father, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for your saving grace. Thou art worthy to be praised. And we come this morning to worship and praise your most holy and righteous name. Almighty, great and Father, we ask you to bless the pastor, Father. Bless the first lady. Bless this entire church family. And all churches, oh Lord, is just in your name. We thank you, Father. Now, Almighty Gracious Heavenly Father, we have many that are sick among us. We have many, Father, that have lost loved ones. Father, we just thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Father, for the peace of God that goes through all the entire world. We thank you, Father. Now, Almighty Gracious Heavenly Father, as a pastor come to us today in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Father, once more again that you have him under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that what he says today, Father, will touch our hearts, our souls, and our minds and cause us to consider you as Lord and Savior in our life. Almighty good Heavenly Father, as he come today with your divine word, Father, we ask you that each one of us in the sanctuary, each one, Father, in the airways, will consider you as Lord and Savior in their life. As he preached, Father, your divine word today, Father, let us be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that each and every one of us, Father, will feel the presence of the Lord. Feel it so, Father, that we will have a revelation with thee, Father. A spiritual revelation, Father, that we may be able to see Jesus coming, coming with all his angelic hosts, coming, Father, with those, Father, that no man can number. We thank you, Father. We know, Father, he's coming for a church without a, without a church, without a wrinkle, Father. And we just say, Father, thank you, Father. And, Father, we're just making ready while we still have daytime. While it's still a day, Father, that we can worship and praise your most holy and righteous name. We thank you, Father. And, Father, we just pray that we be able to go back with you to always, Father, henceforth and evermore, be around the throne of God. Saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, God Almighty, the perfect Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. We thank you, Father. And Father, when we get there, Father, we'll be able to see what John saw when you allowed him to pull back the curtain of eternity. And he looked, Father, and he saw. And he pinned, O oh Lord, eyes have not seen, now ears heard, now entered into the thought of man, the old things that are that are required that we may be able to see that love God. We love you, Father. And help us, Father, while it's yet day, Father. While it's yet day, Father, help us to reach out and tell a dying, sin sick world to come to Jesus. After a while, Father, it'll be all over, Father. And we'll be able to say, thank you, Jesus. All we want you to say, Father, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> You're good and faithful servant. This I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Greater St. Paul. Come on and let's lift up the name of Jesus on this morning. Anybody came for a blessing? Did anybody wake up coming for a blessing? Hallelujah. Did anybody come for a blessing?
come on and clap your hands for the most high one more time. We're just the deliverers. It's all up to you on how you take it and how you let it soak into your spirit. Hallelujah.
name of Jesus. Come on and worship his name, yeah. Savior Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the devotion our officers have led us in today. We praise God and thank him for our ushers who serve um, in our midst, technical department, all of those that make up the ministries of this great church. Thankful for our members, our guests, and our friends, to those that join us by way of social media, to all my father's children. It's good to be here. Amen. Uh, amen. It is good. Amen. <laughs> yes, Lord. Thankful for Sister Franklin and Amen and Kamaya and Amen. I want to invite your attention to a very familiar passage of Scripture that is recorded in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. A very familiar passage. Amen. We solicit your prayers. And we invite you to stand together with us as we give attention to this passage. You have read the announcements, and we certainly pray that you will govern yourself according to the announcement. Our midweek services, of course, are canceled um, this week as we celebrate this Thanksgiving season. Amen. And we wish each of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Will you say amen? Romans chapter 12. God, we are thankful to you for this time together. Oh God, we pray that you have received these songs of worship. God, they have helped us to declare your glory. God, we pray your presence in our midst. We pray that you hide us now behind the cross. Wash us with your blood. Fill us with your spirit, O oh God, and use us as your tool. For it is our desire that the name of Jesus Christ be magnified in our midst. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Here we are, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable 
and perfect will of God. God bless you. you. May be seated in the presence of the Lord from these few verses. And for just a mo few moments this morning, I want to use for a sermon titled, Thankful for the Change. Amen. Thankful Amen. for the change. Thankful for the change. By now, I know that you are very familiar with this text that we have read together. I'm even reminiscent of the times that I have been privileged to share from this text in our service. But this morning, my brothers and sisters, I want to use Paul's words here to the believers at Rome to declare that I am thankful for the change. Thanksgiving is one of the foundations of the gospel. Thanksgiving is one of the foundations of the gospel. Thanksgiving is foundational to the gospel. The gospel. The good news, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his holy and righteous living among men, the sacrifice he made on Calvary's cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, his rising from the grave with all power in his hand, that being witnessed before men and according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. I want to declare this morning, my brothers and sisters, that thanksgiving is foundational to the gospel. In other words, uh, as the gospel is declared, those who are recipients of the good news ought to be thankful. Thanksgiving is foundational to the gospel. Thanksgiving lies at the floor of the gospel message and those who hear the gospel ought to be thankful. As a matter of fact, if you are not thankful hearing the gospel, there, there is something wrong, not with the gospel, but with you. Amen, because Thanksgiving is foundational the gospel. Who can hear such good news, such gracious declaration, and not be thankful? Who can approach the loving mercy of an almighty God and not be thankful? My brothers and my sisters here, um, Paul makes a declaration in chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I want to I make sure that we observe that conjunction, the word therefore. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore. Therefore, this term is used like a hinge on a door. It is the connecting power of the door to hold steadfast against the wall. It connects the door to the wall. Paul uses the word therefore. Therefore holds together the doctrinal principles and the practical operation. The word therefore holds together the doctrinal principles and the practical operation. That word therefore, it is a very important word. It is Vitally important that these two remain linked together. Doctrinal principles and practical application. In other words, we must not only know right, but we must do the right that we know. Doctrinal, it is doctrinally principled that the people of God would know the difference between right and wrong. 
But along with the doctrine of that which is right comes the practical application of right and righteous behavior. For we not must, uh, I mean, we must not only know right, but we must do the right we know. So Paul, my brothers and sisters, start chapter 12 with the concept of consecration. After a lengthy discussion concerning justification, after Paul deals with the elements and articles of sanctification, after Paul clears up the issue of salvation, Paul here in chapter 12 presents the doctrine of consecration. Consecration simply means to be dedicated unto God. Paul urges us here in chapter 12 not to conform to the ways of the world but that if we would be consecrated unto God we Christians have a mandate to be non-conformist we are called to be people of conviction not conformity we are called my brothers and sisters to have moral nobility not social acceptability it is frightening my brothers and sisters to see the church community more concerned with being socially acceptable than they are with being morally righteous there is a denominal faith over the last several political seasons that have chosen to embrace a behavior that is morally reprehensible in their desire to be socially acceptable and powerful. Christians, according to the Bible teaching, are called to be morally noble, not necessarily socially uh, acceptable. I think that's why Peter said we are peculiar people. We don't pursue the crowd. We don't pursue the popular way. We pursue the righteous path. Have I got a witness this morning? To accomplish this, Paul says there must be sacrifice. There must be surrender. There must be an offering made to God to accomplish moral nobility. There must be sacrifice. Yes, to achieve moral nobility, there must be surrender. And then Paul says there must be an offering made unto God. Well, how much does it cost? The skeptic would say this moral nobility. How much must I pay? What is the price? that I must pay. What, what should we give is the question uh, the skeptic might ask. I would say to him or her, well, try giving your all and then trusting God with the change. <laughs> what does it cost? Huh? What is the price? How much must I pay? Try giving you all. And then trust God to give you back the appropriate change. Our, our granddaughter Ari we went shopping in a, in, in a store where there were toys and candies, you know, things that the young people like. She had some money. And she was given the, the privilege to go and purchase what she wanted and buy what her money would buy. She asked my wife, Should I, can I get this? Mm -hmm. Can I get this? Mm -hmm. Can I get this? Mm -hmm. Then she was charged to take what she had gotten to the register and pay for it with her money. She took her money to the register and she gave uh, the attendant behind the register all that she had. The attendant then counted some 
and then gave it back to her. She never looked at it. She folded up her hand and she was ready to walk away. My, my wife said, did you, did you look at your change? Did you even see how much you got back? Oh, Ari, if I could speak for her, she was saying, I got what I want. It doesn't matter what the change is. <laughs> I, I'm preaching in here this morning. How about giving God all that you have and then trusting him to give you back the appropriate change? Are you praying with me this morning? So I simply want to make um, a few points from Paul's letter to the believers at Rome. I would to have you know this morning, my brothers and sisters, that at the time of Paul's writing, Rome was considered the most sophisticated society on the face of the earth. Rome, Rome was considered the richest nation on the face of the earth the most powerful military on the face of the earth. In other words, I want you to know that what Paul writes here is declared um, from the uttermost to the guttermost. In other words, Paul would say, you can't get too high for my God. You can't get too powerful for my God. You can't get too big and mighty for my God. And so Paul would have us to know him as he makes this argument concerning consecration, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, give God all that you have. That's reasonable. Well, what do I get back? I'm glad you asked. Three quick points and then we're on to the Thanksgiving table. First of all, I want you to notice in this text and in Paul's argument that he declares that salvation is abundantly available. That's my first point. Salvation is abundantly available. Come on, help me preach it. Say salvation is abundantly available. Salvation is abundantly available. Salvation is abundantly, somebody who's saved ought to rejoice right there. You ought to be thankful for the abundance of our God. I, I want you to know this morning that the God I serve is a God of abundance. Salvation is abundantly available. You didn't get it because you were so special or because you were so wonderful or because you were so good or knowledgeable. You got it because God has made salvation so abundantly available. Pray with me this morning. Look at the abundance of God. I can remember my brothers and sisters growing up that Thanksgiving was a time, was a season that we would experience abundance uh, that we wherever we went that there were tables of abundance some who typically didn't have substance or supply all year long would somehow at Thanksgiving time have their tables overflowing with good good food good bread good sweets good things abundantly supplied during the Thanksgiving season. And that was my brothers and sisters without regard to one's net income. And that remains to be the case today. For somehow people who have nothing at Thanksgiving time God makes a way where they can line up and get what they need so that their tables would reflect abundance. Uh, it doesn't matter what the means. Uh, some will line up at these certain places where they're donating and giving. It doesn't matter what the means. Because whatever it is, don't you know that God has supplied it? Doesn't matter how much your income, don't you know that God has supplied it? Doesn't matter what side of the tracks you live on. Don't you know that my God shall supply? 
Oh, according to, not according to income, but according to his riches. I want to have, I got a witness this morning. My God supplies our need according to his riches. Philippians 4, then come over to Ephesians 3, and here where Paul says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above what we think or ask. Somebody is sitting here today, my brothers and sisters, because God went above and beyond. That reflects the abundance of God. Salvation is abundantly available. Salvation, salvation is sure. You don't have to sit around and hope. The God we serve is a God of certainty. Salvation is sure in Christ Jesus. For the Bible declares there's no other name given on, among men whereby we must be saved. You don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder. Just put your trust, your hope in Jesus. Whoever you are. Wherever you are. Whatever station you're in in life. Whatever you have done or have failed to do. Salvation does not depend on your goodness. But salvation is a bright product of the goodness of God. For I heard him say that he gives salvation by grace. Paul wrote, for by grace are we saved. And not that of yourself. Least any man should boast. And so that salvation is so abundantly available. That if any man be in Christ. He becomes the new creature that Paul declares here in chapter 12. Salvation is not only abundantly available. But thank Sanctification is absolutely accessible. That's point number two. Sanctification is absolutely accessible. We serve an absolute God. Yes, we do. Scripture says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You hear, what the, you hear what the writer said? He said, whosoever. It doesn't matter whether I like them, love them, hate them, can't stand them, can't contain them. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. The Bible says, whosoever sh shall call upon the name of the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That you can be sanctified based upon your calling and depending on the Lord. Some would suggest this morning, my brothers and sisters, uh, that sanctification is a byproduct of denominationalism or a certain type of discipline. But the Bible says that we have not a high priest, Hebrews 4 and 15, uh, which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Paul said in his letter to the believers, at Corinth as he warns them of unrighteousness warns them about ungodliness as he warns them that they ought not be idolatrous that they ought not be adulterers that they ought not be whoremongers, thieves or drunkards Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 he says Remember that some of you were just that. And as Paul reflects the truth by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, I want you to hear him again. He says, for those things some of you were. Ain't God all right? So, yeah, yeah, some of us at certain times have been idolaters, adulterers, whoremongers, thieves. Gossip, backbiters. Have I got a witness here? Paul says there's those things 
Some of you were. But then Paul put a conjunction. He said, but ye are washed. <laughs> Hear what he says. He said, ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Watch this. He didn't say you were washed. He said that you are washed. He did not say that you were sanctified. But he said you are sanctified. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm glad to say that I thank God that the Lord is washing me right now. If there's any defiled thing that is in my members, God washes me, sanctifies, separates me so that it's no longer me, but Christ that dwells in me. Sanctification is absolutely accessible. In other words, I remember the time that the good Baptist folks would not claim to be sanctified. And those we called the sanctified folks thought that they were different from uh, believers who were Baptists. But thanks to the glory of God, that salvation or sanctification is absolutely accessible to all that call upon his name. You may not feel sanctified, but I declare, my brothers and sisters, if you have put your hope in Jesus, by the power of the spirit of the living God, you have something on the inside which separates you from this world. I'm sanctified because my sanctification was absolutely accessible. I, I, I'm going on. In other words, our change is sure. For we have um, a man of security that is affectionately attainable. Right. We have security, somebody, we are sealed. God not only saved us, but he separated us. Saved us, separated us, and sealed us. So that our security would no longer be in our hands. For he has placed us in his hands. And I heard John write that my sheep hear my voice and I hold them in my hand and no man can pluck them from my father's hand. Are you praying with me this morning? My father, which is greater than all, holds them in his hand and no man can pluck them from my father's hand. In other words, my salvation and my sanctification is secure. I'm locked up. I'm tied up. I'm tangled up. I'm put up by the power of an almighty God. I, 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 I want you to hear what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. But that God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, God gave his son. Did you hear what he said? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some of us have gotten so holy that we feel like we are above and beyond sin. And sin only describes the other folks. But I got news for you today. As long as you dwell in this earth and tabernacle, you need the security that only God can give. Hear what Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable Savior. Yes, my brothers and sisters, as I leave this morning, not only do we have salvation, sanctification, and security, it's good to know that we have all of these things because we have a Savior. Anybody know our Savior? 
We have a savior that was abused and afflicted. Now, my brothers and sisters, I've, I've been privileged to study, or just uh, to overview a few faiths, a few other forms of godliness. I'm not here to do a comparative study. I, I don't have enough knowledge to do that, but I will say that when I compare Christianity, and what I have learned about other faiths, yes, no other faith seems to give the answer for our sin in the person of an abused savior. All right. In other words, Buddha wasn't beaten up. Confucius wasn't whipped. Muhammad wasn't pierced in the side. No other faith has given the redemption of mankind by the way of a savior who was abused and afflicted. Here's what Isaiah said, he is despised and rejected. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we held, we hid the, as it were our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed not. Surely he hath borne our grief. For the Bible says that he carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgression and he was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him Isaiah said like a lamb before the slaughter he was led to destruction and like a sheep before his shearer he said not a mumbling word Isaiah was pointing to the time when Jesus of Nazareth yes the one that was born in a manger's head Isaiah he points to a period when Jesus the Lamb of God will come into the world to bring about a change I'm leaving you this morning when I tell you that I thank God for my change yeah I'm so glad for my change Jesus Mary's baby to my sins on his shoulders and he marched up the narrow way have I got a witness here Jesus that sweet lamb of God Savior 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 of all mankind Jesus the holy and the righteous Jesus the anointed child Jesus the branch yeah, that was wounded for our iniquity the Bible says that Jesus come with me a few more minutes I was reading a story about two women that went shopping during the holiday season they went shopping and one of the women could not find a baby set up so she set her baby in the back of the car and they went shopping for holidays ain't God alright they shopped and they loved their shopping they shopped and they bought gifts and they bought things that they could present as gifts and when the shopping was all wrapped up they got in the car and began to drive down the highway 
gifts in tow and the baby in the back and they were chatting and they were talking what a time we had when we were shopping and all of a sudden they heard a rattling coming from the back and the door of the car flew open and the baby tumbled out on the highway oh lord the story goes on to say how the women slammed on the brakes pulled over to the side and got out of the car to run back for the baby and when they got back there by the baby there was a baby and right behind the baby was a line of traffic that had stopped just inches from running over the baby ain't God alright they looked in on the baby and there was a man that was over the baby and he said the baby is still breathing but we need to get the baby to the hospital and so they gathered the baby up and the man put the women and the baby in his truck are you praying with me yeah Lord he got behind the wheel and hurried over to the hospital and when they got there to the hospital the baby was still breathing but unconscious they took the baby in the emergency room and in the surgery and after a while the doctor came back and he said well ma'am your baby is still breathing I checked the baby and there are no broken bones your baby has a few scars but other than that he's gonna be alright ain't God alright somebody shout this morning I said God who's able ain't God able won't he make a way out of no way won't the Lord protect you won't the Lord guide you won't the Lord make everything alright I leave you this morning with a mother standing over the baby tears rolling down from my eyes the baby had been unconscious the doctor couldn't wake up the nurses couldn't wake him the mother standing there with tears coming from her eyes and all of a sudden the baby opened her eyes ain't God all right and the baby said mama mama I wasn't scared when I was laying out there on that highway mama I didn't get scared because I knew that you were soon to come mama I'm thankful today for that man that stood over me with his arms stretched out and the light shining in the back of the man the baby said I'm so glad I'm so thankful I'm thankful I said I'm thankful for my change anybody hear change come on let's stand all over the sanctuary my brothers and sisters when I read that that just did something to my heart to imagine a little bitty baby having no control of her situation or her, her circumstances tumbling out of the car falling by the wayside could have been dead 
cars and trucks could have crushed them. The fall itself could have destroyed her. There she lay. And then she, she reports a man standing there with outstretched arms. You know, my heart began to weep because I didn't look at anybody else. I looked in the mirror of myself and I saw that it wasn't my fault. I was born in sin. Sin is not something I desired to do or somebody I desired to be. I didn't have a choice. I tumbled out just like this baby into this world stained with a crimson stain. Should have been dead. Anybody, can anybody say that some of the, some of the things I've gone through should have snatched my life. But there was a man standing in the way. Amen. I'm thankful. He changed me. Turned my life around. And placed my feet on a solid foundation. Purchased my redemption when he died on the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose for my redemption. Thank you. We pray God's blessing upon you. And as you stand together, Reverend Smith is coming to guide and lead us in the way of the invitation. We need to be thankful again, amen? Because God been so good to us. He didn't have to do it, but he did it anyhow, amen? There may be someone here who want to give their life back to God. As Sister Lewis sing a song of their choice. Oh, those are church. so much to be thankful for and it would just simply be a tragic to call ourselves saved and fail to be thankful. I'm thankful for my change and now we're ready to go down from this holy place to the hedges and the highways and do my part for the kingdom of God. I want to remind you that if you're here and you have not had an opportunity to give, um, the boxes are prepared in the rear of the sanctuary you are a visitor and you don't have an envelope, uh, you're certainly welcome to give by seeing one of the altars, Deacon Davis with your whole officers 
Um, you, I'm sure everybody know Deacon Robert Davis. Uh, you certainly welcome to worship God in giving. All hearts and minds satisfied. Would you be kind to stand with us? Now the grace of God, the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, may it rest, rule, and abide here now and forevermore. Let us all sing together. Amen. God bless you. 